Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Chronicles of Mr. I am Mr. Pierre, and I am joined by Mrs. Ray, an amazing educator. Um, and so, Mrs. Ray, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Same, same, same. So, um, just for transparency, saw you on TikTok, saw one of your uh, videos where you were talking about culturally responsive teaching, and in particular, how to help kiddos come up with those types of questions. Um, if I could just start off first with, um, how did you get into education? What brought you into the field? Um, well, what brought me into education, I would say, was an educator. Um, growing up, there really wasn't a lot of other things that I saw outside of teaching. It, that just seemed like the one thing that I could do and would do. So um, I went into education, um, I guess, as a I wasn't intentional about it. I'll say I had started my certification program. I was scared of tests. I have huge test anxiety. So I was just like, I'm not going to do it. And I was it's looking for <laughs> Yeah. I was just looking for something and a friend of mine worked at a charter school and I was just looking to do office work and, and they called me in to actually be an educator uh, based off of my English uh, degree. And so that's initially how I got started. Awesome. So yeah. what, what has kept you since it wasn't something that you initially were looking to do, no. but now that you're in it, what's kept you in, in staying? Because we know a lot of folks, they get in knowing they want to get in and then yeah. Oh, wow. um, my journey was bumpy. Um, when I started education, um, I was at a charter, a really small charter, and they did not offer training. It was really just, uh, I always tell people, you know, there's the YMCA learning how to swim. And then it's like, you're with your cousins in the summertime <laughs> at their apartment pool. <laughs> and they just throw you in. I did not get the YMCA uh, experience. <laughs> I was with the cousins in the pool and you had to make it back or they was gonna beat you up for getting them in trouble for throwing you in the pool. Um, right. So it was a quick and dirty, had to learn trial and error um, experience. And I'm the kind of person where I wanna be great at something. I'm gonna just keep pushing myself until I get it. And I think every year, um, from my first year, I just wanted to do better. I wanted to do better and I wanted to, to fix it. What's kept me in education is the relationships that I've been able to build with students. Um, I think, as you know, as an educator, education is, is a, let me try to think of the right word. It's, it's a really toxic and, It's a sad place right now for educators, and I think we're losing hope um, in the system as it as it as it is right now. I think as a teacher, I was hopeful, and I think once you gain knowledge, I got my my master's degree a year ago, and I it opened my eyes up to administration, and I was just like, oh my gosh, like if I don't get to the very top, what can I do <laughs> to change anything if I'm not working for, you know, TEA, which is our Texas Education Agency, or, you know, the powers that be, there's, what am, what am, what am I really changing in the classroom? What am I really changing um, as a principal, which is why I did not become a principal. <laughs> um, but it's, it's such a scary place. And, and I think many teachers are feeling like there's no hope. And so for me, I can't leave because that's one less black educator in the classroom. Um, there's so few. And um, I'm actually pursuing my doctorate degree right now. And I'm looking at that, the, the, the numbers of black educators are so few. Um, even in my own experience, I have only been taught by five from elementary to high school, I've only been able to have five black educators. Um, and that number goes down from undergrad to graduate work. Um, and even now in my doctoral program, I don't have any black professors throughout the entire program. And so it's just like, if I leave, <laughs> what is, you know, what does that say? And so it's, it's, it's the fight and I don't wanna not 
be be a part of it in any way. You are, and it's part of the reason why I wanted to have this conversation is because you are saying all the things that I think a lot of us who identify as Black and people of the global majority that we're going through, we recognize how difficult it is or has been, was to get to where we are. And like, we don't want our kids to have to go through that, like unnecessarily. So if we can be present to assist, support in whatever way that we can, that's what we're looking to do. And like you just saying, like, how do we change anything? Because you may feel like, hey, as a teacher, I know that I have a principal above me who said, hey, as a school, this is what we're doing, X, Y, Z. And consequently, if what your vision is doesn't align with that, then, you know, things are going to be done to, to push you out. And then as a principal, I may have a superintendent who's like, hey, as a district, we want to do X, Y, Z. And if your vision doesn't align with that, they'll use numbers or whatever to say blah, blah, blah. And then mm -hmm. above that, it's like I'm in a state where certain things are being restricted or we're being taught that we're being told that we can't teach blah, 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 whatever. And so it's like mm -hmm. there's always someone somewhere it seems that there's a barrier there's a, there's, yeah yeah that makes there's it barriers and i think yeah. um there's you have to play a game it's it, it's all it's all a game is <laughs> the politics and i think yeah. you add that layer yeah and you add that layer of blackness and identity to it it's another layer of you know, I don't automatically get the respect. I don't automatically get the authority. I have to know someone and I have to, you know, play the game. And it's just like, you know, I don't do too well. <laughs> I don't do too well at playing games. I just I just want to change something. And, and I think you see um, films like Lean On Me and, you know, we, where are the Joe Clarks of the world? <laughs> and uh, the radical nature of education is is changing and people are afraid and people you know it was a um a woman that messaged me on tiktok and was like i would love to teach those books but i would get fired and that was just like what <laughs> like what what like you know i'm 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 nervous about where education is going and i think we're leading back into those 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 times where the Black Panther Party and you know Fred Hampton's movement for the youth is like we have to become radical now and just not care. Um, even this new, I started teaching high school this year, and I was upfront with them. I was like, I need the autonomy. This is what is important to me. I'm culturally responsive. I'm going to teach these topics. I'm going to address cultures. Like, I need you to understand who you're hiring, what I'm yeah. about. And I don't want any guessing. I don't want any problems. <laughs> this is, you know, these are the things that I teach, you know, and, and is that okay? And so I'm like, let's just be very clear before you hire me. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to know what you're getting. Yeah, like, this is what I'm going to do. So, like, yeah. if I come in and the curriculum you're giving me is whitewashed, yep. I'm going to change it. And, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, I just think we have to become radical. I mean, anyone who decides to remain in education is automatically, like, what's that epic picture of uh, uh, Malcolm at the window with that AK? <laughs> This is what, this is what we're doing. Here. Yeah. But but that is, it's wild that that is sort of the sentiment that to teach facts, to teach history as it is, to teach kiddos of like, this is what it was and we don't want it to go back to that. And that is now being deemed radical and that's being deemed extreme. Um, yeah. And for, for, for us and our kiddos, like, we don't have the luxury of being able to be like, oh, we can just chill. Because we recognize that that chilling sort of like, that's time that's lost that is at our detriment ultimately. Um, and as educators, I what I'm hearing you say is like, look, I've been, I've been through what I've been through and there's no need for our kiddos to go through the same thing. Um, and if we can assist and support them so that they can do better, then 
look, that's what I'm about to do. And what I heard you say to your employers are like, look, are you about this life? Because this is what I'm about. <laughs> Just know what you're about to get into because we're about to get into it. Yeah. And I think that's the difference between the district that I came from was predominantly Black and uh, Latino. And so there was a lot of flexibility because unfortunately our Black and brown parents are not as involved when it comes to, I guess, a secondary education. So the freedom was there, you know, yeah. and because a lot of the con the concepts and literature I used, it reflected my kids. So they they waved no flags. And so yeah. um, now I'm in a predominantly white space. I last semester, I didn't teach any black or brown students. Oh. This semester, I only have three black children that I'm teaching. And so it's like, oh, my God, like. How do I teach the, you know, the things I taught before in this white space with these kids? It's like, will they care? Will they be interested? Will they report me? Yeah, right. <laughs> like, you know, all things. And the crazy part is, and this is what I've been telling uh, people, it's not the kids. The kids are not the problem. It's the adults. It is the grown people. The kids don't care. The kids will read dinosaurs in the hood. The kids will have conversations about um, uh, what is that? Whatever. <laughs> they'll read yeah. anything and they'll talk about anything and they'll address it and they'll have great conversations. It's the adults that we're fighting and it's this future generation that we really got to get because they're the ones who are going to change all of this stupid crap that we're dealing with today so this is what i wanted to get into the what do you think is the reason why i have an idea as to why i think that is but i'd like to before i throw it out there just hear your thoughts on why do you think that is that there is so much pushback there is so much like our kids can't handle this. Don't don't indoctrinate our kids. Blah blah blah. All the whatever that's being said. Why do you think that is? I think it will challenge the bias, the beliefs, the the systems that are already in place, and it will cause us to have conversations that require change. And so for many people, thing. we don't we don't want to. Yeah. We don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> we like this. It's cozy. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, we're thinking the same thing. Cause it, it, exactly what you're yeah. saying too of I teach middle school and my middle school kiddos as a lot of times as the older person, I'm just like, Oh, you can handle these conversations. It's just about a matter of Am I setting it up so you understand why we're talking about what we're talking about? What are the what is the context mm -hmm. to then be able to engage in this conversation where because the kiddos they're like, I haven't done anything. I'm in this world, I'm new, I'm fresh, I don't have a history of doing X, Y, or Z, therefore, yeah, I'm free to talk about whatever. But as you mentioned, there are parents, grandparents, folks who are still alive who are like, Yeah, if we talk about this. I'm a part of that system that we're looking to change or that um, is going to have to change because it's, it can't continue the way that it is. Yeah. And so um, that comfortableness of, that you mentioned, yeah, is 100% there, yeah. Yeah, and I think, like, here's a perfect example, um, and I actually shared this in my interview, <laughs> that epic question, is there anything that you would do again? You know, anything that, you know, you might have done wrong and you would do it again? Um, I was teaching English one last year and uh, Meek Mills, I can't think of the album, but it's it's a pretty memorable album cover where there's, you know, it's a cartoon uh, album cover where there's breasts and, you know, it looks like strippers, basically money, motorcycles. It was yeah. the top of the uh, 2021. <laughs> and I was having a Socratic seminar on violence against w women. We used Margaret Atwood's quote that basically men's whole life goal is to kill women. 
<clears throat> and so we were arguing this point and I, and I saw the buzz around this um, album cover and I wanted to talk about it because the interesting fact is a woman, a black woman created this album cover that everyone is so upset about. And so mm -hmm. I wanted my students to talk about it. And again, the district I was from was predominantly black and Latino. And I had three, I think there's probably three white children in the whole school. <laughs> and I had them all that year. And one of my students was absent that day um, that we were talking about it and was doing it at home. And so his parents saw the album cover and it was an uproar. This is completely inappropriate. You know, why? What's the context? I don't understand why. What's the why? And so, yeah. you know, no one else is teaching this. Why are you teaching this? And, and I had to... <laughs> stand my ground on this. And I was yeah. like, one, this is art. This is art. Would you challenge, you know, Michelangelo's David? Would you challenge, um, and I want to say that same year in Italy, they had just released um, another statue of a nude woman. Mm -hmm. Nude. You see the mm -hmm. nipples. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many pieces art of white naked women and we don't say that that's inappropriate we don't say it's inappropriate it's taught <laughs> in art classes in college you get to analyze that but we yeah. can't analyze this art from the african-american woman if she's creating that and she's not saying that that's inappropriate right why do you who gets to decide that black experiences and black art and black literature is inappropriate. Why? And this is why <laughs> we have to have these conversations about it. And even in class, yeah. like, oh, miss, why, you know, why are we looking at this? I'm like, you watch anime. You watch, are all of you guys watch anime where there's literally boobs floating on water? I'm like, anime is all about sex. But you can't look at this album cover and have a conversation about it. And you're saying that that's inappropriate because they're black. Like we have to have these conversations. Who gets to decide? Yeah. Yeah. There it is. There it is. Who are the gatekeepers? Who are the ones who make those choices yes. as to what goes through and what doesn't? What's deemed yes. appropriate, what's deemed not. And nine times out of 10, and especially, and this is my current battle, White women are the gatekeepers. Hmm. White women are the 77% <laughs> educators in the classroom. Yeah. And that's who we're fighting. They get to decide yeah. what curriculum. They get to choose. I'm, I'm dealing with this today. Oh, Ray, we love that for you. We love that, that idea for you. That sounds great in your classroom. Yeah. We love that for you. You're, that would be great for your kids. Why can't everybody experience this? Yeah. Why just me? But you hired me because you wanted me to diversify the curriculum. Because yeah. before I got there, the only text that you had for this the whole unit, this whole semester long course was MLK's letter to Birmingham. That's it. I teach a philosophy course. So it's automatically white. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. This is the only text, right? So it's just like, why is that? Why is that? And I'm not a I'm not a philosophy girl, so I had to do my research. I'm like, mm. okay, yeah, I'll teach this class, but there have to be other Boy. philosophers of different cultures and races. And surprise, surprise. <laughs> There are. Oh my God. <laughs> where they, where they so, come from? Where they at? <laughs> yeah, they're, ev they're everywhere. You know, mm -hmm. Audrey Lord, Amiya Shrin Vassan, Amartya Sin. Like, there's so many other people that are of different races, of different sexualities. And this is the biggest thing. To be an educator today requires work because it's not going to be handed to you. Diversity and culturally responsiveness is not, here you go, you gotta work, you gotta yeah. do the research, you gotta find it because it's not automatically there. 
So what do you say to a young teacher who hears what you're saying, like, but where do I go, Miss Ray? Where do I go? What, how do I find these resources? Pierre, this is going to sound real ghetto. <laughs> Give it to me straight. I just want the real. I just want the real. I will literally, I'll have an idea and I will literally go to Google and type black man crying poem pdf <laughs> you know whatever will pop in you know i'm like i need something for this specifically and literally i'll type in the most random things words in google and it will come and eventually as you start looking as you start digging you start to learn uh, different poets, you start to experience uh, different literature and the names and it just starts to create almost like Dexter, all those mm -hmm. red lines <laughs> start to connect. So the more time you spend digging, the more you become familiar. It just it takes time to create your arsenal of culture, I would say. So what I'm hearing you say is that we have this tool at our fingertips called Google. It's just going to take some effort on our part to yeah. go in, however random it might be, use Google, and then from there start to glean or wean away all the yeah. extra stuff to be able to get to the thing that you're looking for. Yeah, I think and I mean, you're, you're an educator. If you're in education, you're not lazy. You, you can't be. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me say, you can. You can. There are. If you, you want to know, be a good educator, though, is what I'm hearing you say. If you yeah. want to be good, yeah. if you want to be good, and if you want to make an impact, and if you want to, um, I like to say I create experiences for students. I'm not a lecturer. I said I'm. I'm like those pastors. I'm not going to be before you long. I'm yeah. just going to set the stage and I'm going to move out the way. I like to create experiences, and I I want my students to have those conversations so that they can learn from one another. And when today, especially there's so much hate speech where students use racial slurs and homophobic slurs. And the more we start to have these conversations and read these experiences, those slurs start to drop. They decrease. Mm -hmm. For me, at least I'll say, when we start to talk about these things, I don't hear, you know, all these different terms and all of these, you know, the stuff these kids say today are crazy yeah. um, towards each other. But when we start to figure out why are you saying that and what does it mean? It starts to shift just a little bit. And yeah. so it takes, you know, I would tell it a, a new teacher to start with the resources that your district has. Um, look through those materials, see what you can find and then isolate one piece take that to Google and start learning, research the authors and explore what was going on at the time. Because honestly, um, I teach English, but English is history. Mm -hmm. It's social studies, mm -hmm. that's, that's all it is. And the more you learn about the background of uh, the author and what was going on at the time, and you you know, start to create those dots and, and the connections and, Next thing you know, you have a full Socratic seminar <laughs> on on just starting from one little little aspect. I, I never got a chance to ask you what what grade um, or what age of age range of kiddos do you teach? Um, I teach currently tenth grade. Okay. So my students are uh, 13, 14. Yeah. <coughs> Sophomore, Actually, okay. no, 14, 15. Um, but I've spent majority of my, I've been teaching for seven years. So a bulk of that time was in middle school. So I taught seventh and eighth grade. Yep. That's my lane. Majority. Yeah. Yeah. I love middle school. Yeah. Same, same. <laughs> middle school is fun. I was like, but I need to get to high school. I need to at least say I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> what, what would you say has been the, the, the difference between middle school versus high school? Uh, they're bigger. There's not much difference. <laughs> I'm just like, ooh, these kids are big. <laughs> There's really no difference. Honestly, 
the only difference for me is just the the race and ethnicity of students I teach now, okay. um, which is I, I spent the first semester feeling like a traitor mm -hmm. because I left and I'm not with the kids that look like me, that come from down the street like me. And yeah. I'm still in the same vicinity, but it's so different. And so now it's like, how do I behave around white and Indian and Asian students? Can I be myself? Can mm -hmm. I still joke like I used to? Like what, how should I behave? And it's crazy because I was very, fra I, I treated them as though they were fragile for the first month. And then I realized these jokers are just the same. Jokers are just the same. Just the There's same. no difference. They're just the same. And so it's it's really about your own mindset and the things we tell ourselves that, you know, I have to do this, I have to be like this. And it's just like those kids do not care. They want to learn. They want to learn from you. They want to know you and they want to relate to. They want to know the why. Yeah. And as long as you can tell any child why they'll do it yeah. <laughs> they'll read yeah. it they'll write yeah. it. just tell them why you just gotta you need to have your why and i'll tell my kids because again i'm the only one who teaches what i teach there's three other teachers who teach philosophy but i'm the only one who teaches it the way that i do and so i tell them this is going to look different you know kids talk mm -hmm. <clears throat> So what we're doing is going to be different from what they're doing. Yeah. And this is why, you know, my classroom has a uh, house. I use a house model to build, mm -hmm. you know, collaborative groups. I have all of my different diverse philosophers. We're going to study different philosophers. Why? Because as a black woman, I feel like it's, it's my responsibility to show you that there's other things besides Socrates. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's other people besides, you know, Aristotle and yeah. Rene Descartes and Karl Popper. There's more people out there. It's not only white men. It's not only white men. Yeah. And so I was like, it's it's just something that's important to me to tie anything that we talk to to something tangible. This is what's important to me. Miss Ray, this is what I do. So having that conversation at the beginning of the school year so that there's not a, why are they? I was like, nothing we're doing is harder. Yeah. I'm not giving you more. It's just going to be different because of who I am. Yeah. And they understand. Knowing, knowing what you know now, because listening to you, like there are so many things that I heard you touch on um, from going from, being at a campus where the majority of the kiddos look like you to now being on a campus where the majority of kiddos don't look like you to how can you be your most authentic real self? How can you hold that intersectionality that you mentioned of like, I'm a black woman, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, th I'm not just this one thing, I'm many things. And to bring that and present that to your kiddos, um, in the material that you're teaching them about. <sighs> Knowing there's so much and that if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. If you could take mm -hmm. one or two things to go back to your younger self and be like, hey, yo, Miss Ray, let me whisper in your ear, tell you this one or two things. And, and you know that your younger self is going to be like, sweet, thank you for that one or two things. Because if you hit me with da, 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 I'm not going to remember anything. But if there's just one or two things I can hold on to, this is what I should hold on to. What would you tell that younger Miss Ray? Read, sis. Read. Read. Is there any be direction? A, be a what? well of knowledge to read about other cultures. I feel like as a people... We want everything black, 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 black on black on black, <laughs> black on black on black. On black. <laughs> we want to stay in our bubble, and I feel like that's valuable. Yeah. But if you're an educator who's going to see every 
type of race, every ethnicity and background and culture. You can't stay in this bubble. And what I would tell my younger self is to read and to explore everything. Um, I feel like I'm playing catch up <laughs> with, with, you know, to understand, to know history and, and know background and connect the dots and see like, oh, this connects to, to this and this experience goes here and this is that because I utilize history so much. Yeah. I'm just to read and be a wealth of knowledge. And so when I'm working with teachers and they're like, oh, I, I really want to do this. Here's a poem. Here's a, here's a memoir. Yeah. Oh, you know what? You can actually reference this event at this time, and it just starts to come. And of course, it comes with time, but I feel like, man, if I had been studying different things or just reading different things, not thinking that I only can read when I'm in school. Mm. I graduated. I'm done. I don't need to read nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> and and to be actually my first year, uh, first or second year teaching, my principal asked, Miss Ray, what are you reading right now? And I was like, reading? I was like, I'm done. I got my bachelor's, I'm finished. <laughs> read. I don't need to read. <laughs> and he said, um, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Like, that's a disgrace. Mm. As an educator, you should never stop reading. You should continuously be learning. And from that moment, um, I, I had always, I just been reading. I think that at the end of that conversation, I pulled up Amazon and I downloaded a book. <laughs> I found a book and I've always just been reading and, and exploring because I wanted to be a resource. Um, not just for myself but for others that's i would say read read sis don't okay. stop. Excellent. don't stop no. reading no I'm, I'm 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 listening to you in in like internally i'm screaming at the top of my lungs yes however i think or at least what's going through my head is also one of like what can I read or what should I read? Cause there's a whole, there's always going to be stuff out there. And so th what would, what direction would you point a person in and be like, Hey, I recognize that this is going to be my taste and this is what's helpful for, for me. However, you should at least give this a shot, give this a shot, give this author a shot. Uh, off the top of my head, a really good book to start, uh, would be Ibram X. Kendi stamped. Okay. Um, that book really put a lot of things into perspective. Also, um, shoot, I take all my, my books to my campus. I'm like, where my books at? <laughs> books at? I feel like an old lady. Um, Ibram X. Kendi stamped really uh, opened my mind to a lot of the structures that makes education so frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um, but honestly, I read, um, I look for books about history, to be honest, more than I do literature, even though I'm an English teacher, because yeah. history is the context behind any any piece of, <laughs> anything yeah. you'll read. Um, honestly, yeah, I just I look, oh, shoot, you my phone. Um, yeah, I would, to save time, that's where I would start. Okay. Um, and find an author that you're interested in. And a lot of times it's trial and error. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. some some authors you're just not going to vibe with. <laughs> this is the truth. This is, yeah. this is boring. I'm, yeah. I'm not into this at all. Um, <clears throat> I read his book and then uh, I did Trevor Noah's uh, Born a Crime. Born a Crime. That's a good one. Because I was interested about, <sighs> about that experience. Um, uh, Ibram X. Kendi's because once I, I fall in love with an author, I read other stuff. How to be an anti racist, yeah. Um, Paul Ortiz and African American and Latinx history of the United States because those were 
my students at the time. Mm -hmm. They were either black or uh, Hispanic. And so I wanted to be able to tie things that they would care about. Um, a lot of times I had a student, Miss Ray, why are you always talking about immigrants in the border? It's like, because I think you should care. <laughs> I think you should care about what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and come to find out he was nervous because he was uh, illegal and <laughs> he I'm was concerned. Like, Miss Ray, are you, are you the ops? <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I'm not. I was like, but it bothers me that there's babies at the border who don't know where their parents are. Right. And I just feel like you should be aware. Um, but really, those those would be my, my starters. They're really great books. And it gives you perspective. Nice. Knowing that there's a lot of heaviness in what we do, um, it can be depressing at times. What's bringing you joy, though, at the moment? And that could be professionally, that could be personally, whatever uh, realm or sector. What's, what's bringing you joy, though? Um, honestly, if I can be truthful, um, last year was not a happy place for me, which is why I switched schools. Mm -hmm. um, I was being cursed out <laughs> all the time. There were Sorry, fights man. all the time. Um, my mental health was, was very poor and I had to get out or I was going to leave the profession. I had lost all hope. Um, I had actually got into it where I'm like, with a, mm. with a 12 year old. And I was just like, what's happening? Yeah. What is happening? And I was like, I have, I need a break. I need to go somewhere else, which is why, um, I'm at this current campus, which is a magnet program. So these kids have to apply to go there. So they're not there for any foolishness. <coughs> Excuse me. There's no fights. Um, there's no, you know, they actually say good morning to mm -hmm. me and they say good afternoon. You know, have a great day, Miss Rain. I'm just like, you too. Yeah. You too. <laughs> it's a complete, complete difference. And that's honestly what's bringing me peace is that I can teach a lesson and it works. Mm -hmm. Anything that I imagine works. There's, you know, these, these students don't require scaffolds. I don't have to differentiate. I mean, it's a cakewalk <laughs> experience and it's, and it's not a tested subject. I teach a, a signature course. So it's like an English elective. Okay. Um, so it honestly just allows me to be a, a fake professor for a little while where things are just easy. Like my PTSD of hearing loud noises, I think there's a fight happening. Mm -hmm. I have to remind myself, like, it's okay. You're you're okay. They're not fighting here. It's just the door. You know, <laughs> it's this location is bringing me peace that I have students who are kind who, you know, the, the level of trauma is not as high. Okay. And there's not a a, a, a need to be like this. On the defensive. Yeah. To, put up my, to put up my fist and be ready for something. Yeah. And, and that's honestly been the piece of mm -hmm. just being in a work environment, regardless of, you know, I have coworkers who don't look like me my students who don't look like me, I honestly go to work and I come home and it's it's peace. There were no fights. No one cussed me out. No one, you know, it's just, it's smooth. It's nice. smooth. And that's bringing me peace. And good. I needed that. Good, good, I good. needed that. <laughs> everyone, everyone deserves that. You should, our kiddos shouldn't feel as if that they need to resort to whatever with their with their teachers and the teachers on the flip side shouldn't feel as if like this is a um yeah. you know war so i'm happy i'm happy that like you that. are experiencing that that you have that that's like that's a, another podcast episode <laughs> look i i thoroughly enjoyed the conversation thus far we'll gladly we'll have a part two um to talk about a, a myriad of other things um in yeah. For myself, I know one of the things that brings me joy is being able to, you know, make my playlist, 
whether it's for the kids knowing that it's going to be played throughout the day or just for myself as I'm about to get into work to put me in that right mind frame. For you, do you have five songs or five artists or five albums or five soundtracks that um that is this, that you would be like, you know what, this is where I'm at, this is what I'm feeling right now, this is uh, what's bringing me joy, bringing me happiness, putting me in that right frame of mind so that I can teach the kiddos and support in the system? Yes, and now that you say that, I would go back and add to my answer. Not only would I tell my younger self, read, but to create a playlist. <laughs> music, music soothes the wild beast. Yeah, real talk. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know when that aha moment, but silence. Students feel like they need to fill that feel space yep. with yep. any kind of foolishness. When you yeah. play music, it's just like, oh, oh. Oh, okay. This is what yeah. we're doing. This yep. is the vibe. Yeah. And and music has literally it gives you a your classroom a it puts as I say, it puts your stank on your classroom. Amen. <laughs> you don't know. Amen. All right, we finna go. You know, it gives yeah. you a vibe. And so, yeah. um, yes, I do have some. So and this was hard. You said five. So I was like, ooh, this is tough. It can, it can be at minimum five, but if you got more than that, that's fine too. I'm not gonna cut you off. No, no, no. I, I follow the rules. <laughs> I follow instructions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be a good student. I follow instructions. Um, so my first song would be Bilal's um, "Sometimes." Mm. Do you know artist. this song? That's a good artist. If you Sometimes. don't know this song, it's gonna bless you. <laughs> It's a true, just a human experience. Sometimes I love this song and it's on my playlist for my class. So it comes on from time to time. Um, Nina Simone's Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood. Nina, that's an artist. Who poet, yes. writer. Oh, fantastic. This song, I think, defined my last two years of education. <laughs> Don't let me be misunderstood. I'm just a soul whose intentions are good. Mm. Says edu every educator. I'm just trying to do right. <laughs> That's it. Um, this is a new artist I found, and I've had this song on repeat. His name is Kamau. And I'm probably saying it wrong. K-A-M-A-U-U. -U. Um, but he has a song called Mango. Uh, the Remix with Masego and another young lady. I didn't write the name down, but that song is, it's a vibe. It's good. Um, Dreamville has a song called Sacrifices and it has a J. Cole and Earth Gang. It actually has quite a few people. The song is like seven minutes long, mm. but it's good. Um, and then my last song, is I'm obsessed. I love Sir and his song Recipe. Recipe, Sir. Yeah. Okay, let's hear this recipe. <laughs> All right, we can jam to that. Oh, yeah. we can jam to that for sure. Yes. Okay. All yeah. right. That is that is a nice one right there. That is a so to anyone who's listening, we will make sure that we put up Miss Ray's playlist. We're definitely gonna have to have Miss <laughs> Ray back because she told us, look, she follows directions. I limited her to five. She could have given us a whole lot more. We're gonna make sure that she gets her whole playlist out there. <laughs> but. Miss Ray, I appreciate you. Thank you so, so much. Um, the thing that I am taking from, the gem that I heard you say, is one, to read. Read so that you have knowledge for yourself, to better yourself, but also to then be 
a resource to others to be able to point them in the directions that they may need to go. And then couple with that, as we just ended with music, make sure you got your playlist, your playlist for your different situations, your different phases, um, where you are, whether it be in the day, whether it be in the season of the, of the academic school year, because we know that there are certain points in the year where you're going to need that playlist to help you make it through to push through to the, um, the next the next break, if you will, or the end of the semester or whatever it may be. So be able to read, read for enjoyment, read for fulfillment, find an artist, a writer who's going to fill you up um, and read and then also be able to have that playlist playing in the background to help you get over those hills, get over those humps, get over those bumps. Did I get that right? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. And then to the to the new teachers who are out there, just know that uh, you have a myriad of other teachers who want you to keep going at it. Our kiddos need you, not just the kiddos who look like you, because representation is important, but also the kiddos, more importantly, that, that don't look like you. They need to see folks who don't look like them in front of them. And so for any teacher who's out there, stay in it. You, you get, you've got a couple of teachers at your back who are cheering you on to, to keep going. Yes, stay in there. We need you. Yeah, we need you. We need you. So I am Mr. Pierre. She is Miss Ray. And this has been another episode of the Chronicles of Mister. And we out.